I promise I won't start crying right now. Maybe I'll leave some tears for the end. But I also would, would like to thank every one of you for coming today to listen to my PhD story. And today I'm going to tell you a story about leuke leukemia. And in particular, I'm, I'm going to tell you a story about AML, which, which, which stands for acute my, my, myeloid le le leukemia. And I want to start my talk by showing you how a sample taken from a, a healthy, healthy person com, com, compared to a sample of, of blood ta taken from a patient with leukemia look, 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 looks like. And with, without me t telling you too, too much about it, you will see that the biggest difference is in the proportion of the white blo blood cells. And in particular, you, you'll see that the, there's an, an enormous amount of white blood, blood, blood cells in the patient with leukemia. However, the, these cells are not healthy blood cells, but we, we call them blast. And they are cells which are accumulated uh, mutations and DNA uh, cha 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 changes, <coughs> with, with which means that they are not able to accomplish the function that they nor normally should. <clears throat> and I want to show you as well how AML is actually a different type of disease. So here I'm showing you six different types of a AML, and uh, with, which are taken from six di different patients. And as you can see, they differ in, in, in the colors of the shell, it, uh, of, uh, of the cell, in the, in the uh, shape of the cells. And um, they, don't just, they don't just look different in, in terms of how they look like, but also in terms of how the patient re, re, res, re, respond to them. 
So here I'm, I'm, I'm showing you curves when every line is a type of leukemia, and I, I haven't shown you all the details about the actual type of leukemia that the patient has because that will occupy too much on, uh, on the slides and also because it's not important right now. What I want you to focus is that every line is a cohort of patients with a um, ML, and here you see that the y-axis is the proportion of patients which are alive, and the x-axis is the years since they enter in, into the study. And one thing that you'll notice is that patients are really, really different. So for instance, if we take a patient uh, at two years, so if, and we, we look at the, blue, uh, the light blue line, you, you'll see that probably only five, 10 per percent of the patient are still alive, while for instance, if, if we take other types of AML, which we, we call the core binding factor AML, or in short, in, uh, CBF AML, you, you, you'll see that these patients actually be, behave better. And I, I pointed you out to these two types of patients because the, this, this is actually the type of leukemia which I, which I worked with. And uh, it com I'm going to have just a source of water. <laughs> so these two types of AML com comprises two, two types of AML where one is a, well, one a patient in which their can cancer cells had a DNA, uh, had a, a DNA e exchange be between chromosome 8 and chromosome 21. And as you can see, you'll see that the arm, that one arm of chromosome 8 is shorter, while one arm of chromosome 21 is lo lo longer. <clears throat> and the same thing happened instead for the other types of CBF AML, where even though it's not that clear from this picture, you'll, you'll, you'll see the chromosome 16, uh, the, the two copies of chromosome 16 change part of their DNA. And you might wonder why we put these two types of family, the, the two, the, these two types of leukemia together. Well, the reason is because in the TA21 patient, there is one gene, which is the RUNX1 gene, and in the, in ver, ver, in the in ver, in ver, uh, in version 16 AML, there is one gene which is instead known as the C, C, CBFB genes, and these two genes in the no, normal cells, they usually work uh, to, together for the normal production of uh, cells. And, um, well, actually, CBF AML is also really hard to study because it's really rare. So AML is com com comprises actually only roughly 3% of all patients which are diagnosed with, uh, well, with, of all cancers which are diagnosed in the US, but I think the statistics is actually pretty similar also here in uh, 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 Australia. And among the 3%, only 15 to 20% uh, are CBF A AML cases. <clears throat> and in terms of the treatment, actually, so in the 1960s, the, uh, the, it, they proved the efficacy of a par particular drugs, which is a type of chemotherapy, which is known as cytarabine. However, after that, for more than th 30 years, they weren't able to improve any new treatment, which means that actually still, still today, relapse is the main cause of treatment Fa 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 failure, which affects roughly 40% of patients with CBF AML. And here is where we come today. So our aim was actually to try to improve our understanding of relapse in CBF a AML. <clears throat> and the way in which we did it is that we worked with a st st study court which was called collected by the L, 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 ALLG, which stands for Aust Australasia Leukemia and Lymphoma Group, and it com comprises a set of 37 CBF AML -M -M 
a male patient, which went through all the same, the same type of treatment, and they were processed and then sequenced here at the WEHI. <coughs> and in this court, they, they took patients from the di diagnostic time, time point, so before the patient received any treatment, and then they follow up the patient after treatment in what we call remission. And then for some patients, actually, we have that the leukemia came back, so we call this time point relapse. And in particular, in this court, we have that only 10 patients went in, into relapse, whereas the other 20, 27 patients didn't. And out of all these time points uh, from, from the trial, they could collected only bulk M, R, and A. And in, and in particular, we, we don't have a full amount of samples for every time point for every patient, but as you can see from here, we only have 36 uh, samples from the first time point, and then we have 36 from the second time point. And this means that I didn't actually have complete samples for all patients at all time points. However, I had it for most patients. And uh, the things that we can do with this uh, data is, for instance, well, do we see any differences in the patients before they actually receive treatment? Or, for example, do we see any changes over time in the cancer? And you might wonder at this point, well, why did we use RNA again, for example, why we didn't, we didn't sequence everything out of these samples? Well, the reason is because, well, the, the easiest, the, not the easiest, the quickest answer is that the L LLG didn't sequence all these things, so we only had DNA for a bunch of sample, but for not all time points. And the other reason is, well, I'm trying to convince you that using RNA could actually be useful. So if, if we take the an, an, an A, and here we have a yellow gene and a green gene, and this is what happens in a no, normal cells, which I normally show as a white cell. So if we look at this one, if you look at the normal process that happened into a cell, we will see that if we only extract the RNA from these cells, we will, see for, we will observe, for example, only one copy of the yellow gene, and we observe two copies of the green gene. That's fine. However, if we then go into cancer, what does happen? So, for example, if you look at the DNA, same situation, we have one yellow gene and one green gene. If we then collect the RNA, we don't see the yellow gene. So the first thing that we can see, as everyone knows, is that we can detect e expression changes in the cancer cells. However, if you imagine and then this, the, the, in the cancer cells, you also have some mu mu mutations, you also see that we can detect mutations if the gene is e ex expressed. So I hope I showed you, or, I mean, I showed you two things that you can do with RNA. Well, you can detect changes in the expression, as everyone normally does, but you can also find, you, you can also de detect mutation if they are actually e e in genes that are e expressed. <clears throat> <clears throat> However, it's not common to do these things in RNA, which is why in the first part of my, of my, of my study, in the first part of my reading and my, um, my, my PhD, what I had to do, I had to research and try to understand what are the methods that we can use in order to detect mutations from RNA, what are the common workflows and the software that people use. And I'm not going to talk about this in my talk because there will be a whole different talk. However, I wrote an online book where I put all my tips and um, just, you know, comments about which software I used and you can find it on my GitHub. However, uh, today I'm going to tell you what happened at the very beginning of the study. And, um, and in particular, when I started my PhD, we didn't really have the sequence sample. So we only had RNA sample from blood and bone marrow stored in the freezer. And so what I had to do initially was actually to set up the experimental design of the whole study. And in particular, this required this deciding, so defining the sequencing design, and also to decide which workflow I wanted to use for the data that I had. Because I showed you I was, I, I've done some research on all different set of software that I could use, but I wasn't sure what was the, you know, most suitable type of w workflows. And this brings me to the first part of my PhD, which was, we'll try to help uh, Ian or Andrew Roberts or um, the other people involved in the project to deciding how many reads we wanted to sequence from our data. 
And to make you understand why this was important, well, imagine that Ian wanted to splurge his money and he wanted to sequence a lot of a lot of uh, read, a lot of fragments of RNA from every sample. Then probably we would have had a lot of power to define what is a real mutation, because we, we would have seen a lot of fragments of RNA in every sample. However, on the other on the other side, if you wanted to be really cheap with the money and not spend enough money, probably we would have found the mutations and said, oh, this is just an error. We don't trust it because there's not enough fragments. So my first task was really to find the balance between spending too much money or spending too little. <clears throat> and to do that, I started by using a set of data, which, I, which luckily they were published in 2016. And they, this included a set of 46 RNA Six sample, which were all, uh, which were also deeply sequenced. So for each sample, I had about 110 million fragments out of each sample. And then what what they did also from from this from this project. So this the Lucigen project is probably one of the largest publicly available um, data set of a AML that I'm aware about that, that I'm aware now. What they did is that they published these 46 RNA samples, and they were actually just CBF AML, so the type of AML that I'm studying, and they detected mutations in, from the RNA, but they also validated those mutations into DNA, so which means that I had a set of true variants which were validated and observing both RNA and DNA. So what I did was I took their data, I took the true set of variants, and then I took smaller and smaller samples out of the initial data, so to s simulate smaller and smaller uh, samples of all these uh, sizes. And then I compared six different workflows that I decided before, so after all those reading. And then I applied the six different workflows to every downsample uh, data. And then I decided, well, how many of the initial true mutations I could still find or how many I was losing. And without going into the details of all the softwares and why I chose something or the other one, because that's almost, that's almost a finished paper and it will take a, quite a while to explain all of that. Well, our final decision was that we decided to sequence <coughs> at least 30 million fragments from every sample. And we also, this, at least, we ended up with between 30 and 50 million. And we also decided to apply different methods to call different types of mutations. And if you are not aware of what the different types of mutations are, in a simple way, well, we have, for example, what we call SNF. SNF means a single change in the DNA. So SNF stands for single nu nu nucleotide variant. And then we have indels. So indels instead of, for example, a deletion of a few bases in the DNA, or it can be an in insertion of a few bases in the, in the DNA of the cancer cells. And as you can imagine, SNF are actually easier to detect than indels. So th this is why we had to use more ad hoc software to detect these more complex type of mutations. And if you have worked with bioinformatics, you might be aware that when you use different software, you always end up with different types of outputs. So some uh, types of output might be in Excel, some might be in other types of formats, some in R. And this, of course, g gave me a huge headache. It was not just about the type of output, it was also about the way in which the software outputs things. So say, for example, in one software they call dog dog, but in the other one they call it little dog, even though it's the same exact exact dog. So what I had to do, I had to standardize and combine the variants output before I could actually use them, before I could actually present them to Ian or to Eddie or to whoever is interested in. And so the, this brings me to the package that I, that I wrote in R where the, the reason was really to bring you know, bring back joy into my life because those were really <laughs> dark times. <laughs> I said, it was really hard. I mean, it was really, it's really tough when you have to deal with so many different variants of the same thing. So after I built all of that, and a lot of this work was actually thanks to the work that I've done with Christopher Fl uh, Flensburg. Not sure if he's here, but he helped me a lot in building this package. And after I did that, I could actually have a tidy set of variants that I could, uh, and 
that's why I then built an app in Shiny, which is now hosted onto the uh, WeHi servers that I could simply use to explore and go through the variants. And I use this a lot when writing my thesis, when I had to interpret and understand the results. You know, this patient has these variants, what ha what's happening on this gene? And also we use it in matings, for example, if we forget, oh, what's, who, what, what are the mutations of these patients? And then we can explore and look through it in a kind of easy and quick way. And with this one, this was the first part, well, it kind of went for the whole three years, but I see it as the first part of my project where we decided how many fragments to sequence, which was 30 million fragments, and then I decided what methods to use. So I've shown you we use different methods. If you're curious to know what methods, why I use something or something else, feel free to come and ask me later or tomorrow. And, uh, and I also... <laughs> And this brings me to my next part. So once, once we had all these variants brought together and uh, standardized and they look very tidy and clean, well, we could actually compare things. So I'm gonna, co I'm gonna show you there is a few results from comparing the samples before the patients, the patient samples before they got the treatment. And I'm gonna show you about the comparison using the mutations, for example, what mutations are different, and using the e expression. I'm going to start by, look, by talking about the mutation. So <clears throat> these were the top, mutate, the top three mutated genes in the CBFML cord. So I will explain you how to read this plot. So every row is uh, for a patient. So every column is for a patient. We had the 36 patients in the first time points. And then we have the top three genes. Uh, the blue cells, if, it, if that patient had a SNF, so a poor mutation into the cancer sample, and the green are instead if they had an indole, so a more complex type of mutation. And as you can see, well, there are only two genes, which are kitten and rust, which are highly mutated among the 36 sample. Highly, I mean, there's a lot of patients with that mutation. And then once we go on to the third gene, there's almost no one with that mutation, with, with that gene mutated. And this is very common in AML. AML patients don't have many mutations overall, so only a handful of genes, uh, a handful of genes, are more mutated. But then you drop very quickly, and it's almost like every patient has got their own specific mutations. However, when I brought together different, I, I brought together published cohorts, and this is the same plot by using two different published cohorts of data where they detected the mutations from the DNA. You can see that, well, again, the top two mutated genes are Kitten and Russ, and then we have a third gene, maybe I'm sure some of you will know this FLAT3 gene, it's part of the same family. And then again, we drop very quickly to a very uh, low frequency mu mutation on this other uh, gene, uh, MCH1A. I don't know. And here we have, uh, a, so even if I had roughly, fi uh, I, have, I had more patient than what, what I had in my cohort. So this was a great joy for us because it means that we could actually, so by using only the RNA, we could actually replicate or at least um, have a similar point of view, um, I mean a similar view of what happens in CBFML in terms of mutation. By only, so by only using the RNA, we re replicated what other, other people have seen by using DNA. So maybe you don't know, but what, you know, the top two mu mu mutated genes were Kit and Russ which is part of this group. So RAS, here I've highlighted RAS, but it's actually a group of proteins. So there is HenRAS, HRAS, KRAS, several RAS uh, members. So these two genes, they're not actually foreign to one another, but they, yeah, they know each other very well. So they're part of the same pathway. And in particular, KIT is a, KIT is this gene, which has a part inside the cell, but it also had a, has a re receptor outside of the cell. Forgive me if I say anything that is wrong, but I'm trying to explain it very, very, with very, very simple words so that I don't make mistakes. And the way in which you can activate KIT, so KIT can be activated in other normal way, but the cancer way of activating KIT is if it has mutation. And here I'm highlighting two mutations, one on the outside, one on the inside. I will get back to those later, or what they are. 
But what happens when KIT is activated is that it activates the downstream pathways until it activates these two pathways, which one is the survival of the cell. So it promotes survival of the cell and the proliferation of the cell. And you might not have studied cancer, but you might have heard a lot of talk and you know that cancer loves these things. Cancer cells love to survive, they don't want to die, and they like to divide and divide and divide. So KIT is actually not unknown, like KIT is a really well, you know, worldwide famous oncogene, and, uh, and, um, and these, are, these are the, you know, one way in which we can be, act the, so the, the protein that KIT produce, produces can be ac activated. <clears throat> So do we see actual differences in the frequency of mutations in patients who relapse and patients who don't relapse? So we had a very small sample size. So maybe you remember we had 37 patients, only 36 at diagnosis. So we have nine patients who relapse and 27 who don't relapse. When I look at the mutations on KIT, I was seeing that five out of nine patients who relapse are mutated on KIT high percentage, I mean higher than the 7 over 27, which instead are kit mutated among the patients who don't relapse. When I look at NRAS, I see the opposite trend. So I see that there are more mutated, um, and so more mutations in NRAS among patients who don't relapse. And in particular, when I look in more details, all these five mutated are only coming from the inversion 16 part. So I don't know if you remember from the very beginning of my talk, I told you CBFAML, which is what I'm studying here, is com comprised two different types of leukemia, one with, inver one with an inversion 16 and one with a translocation between chromosome 8 and 21. So only inversion 16 patients have this mutation. And well, it's also because, and I want to stress this, among the nine that we have relapsed, six are in version 16 and three are A21. So it's kind of, you know, we have a higher probability of for sure of getting mutations in inversion 16. But the other thing that I noticed is that all this mutation in kit were coming from this exon 8, and they were complex indoles. When I look into the seven instead, I see that the mutation in kit in patients who don't relapse were mainly from exon 17 and two from exon 8. And maybe you remember the pathway before. Well, these are the actual the, the two exons. So the, in, the, the hotspot inside of, of the cell is actually exon 17. And it is actually a well-known hotspot. So normally, if a patient is diagnosed with CBFML, they will also be screened for the probably highly, very likely they will also be screened for this mutation. However, this exonate is not normally sequenced, is not normally screened, so pa pa um, clinicians don't normally look into this mutation because its function is not well known, it's not, we're not really sure if it's you know, important for relapse or if it's important for the disease. So there's way less studies done on this, on this exonate mutation. And, well, the fact that the RAS pathway is mutated in CBFML is not new. So the title there, CBFB MY, MYH11, actually stands for in, in, inversion 16, is another way to call this type of um, patients. So in this paper, they were, which is actually from 2010, they knew that roughly 90% of the uh, patients with inversion 16 also have mutation into the RAS pathway, and also that mutant and RAS mutant, uh, um, they were seen to have a better survival and a lower risk of relapse. On the contrary, patients that have a mutation on KIT tend to have a higher risk of relapse. However, as I said before, and for KIT, there's a lot of a controversy on KIT. There's not really sure, I'm not sure why myself, why this controversy, but some studies find an association with relapse, some others don't find it. We do find it, but again, we have a very small sample size. So what I've shown you now is that by looking at the mutation before the patient go into treatment, I could see that, kit, that there are more mutations in KIT among patients who relapse. And then all the KIT mutant patients who relapse are, uh, have a mutation on exon 8, and they are all in version 16 patients. So what happens in the expression? <clears throat> 
So here I'm showing you an MDS plot. I'm not sure how many of you have seen it before, but the idea of an MDS plot is that we try to summarize the high di dimensionality of the genes. So normally every patient, every sample for a patient will have roughly 15, 20,000 genes. And of course you can't compare them all. I mean, it's kind of hard to visualize them all together. So what we do by using statistics is that you, you squeeze down the 50,000 genes for all the, all the samples into a lower number of features, which here I call as first dimension and second dimension. And the way in which you read the plot, which you, you normally use this plot to find interesting clustering of the data. The way in which you read this plot is that every, in this case, in this uh, example, <coughs> every dot is a patient, is a sample from a patient at diagnosis, so before they receive treatment. And the further the, the dots are, the more different the samples were. So in this case, these two are almost the most different. And I did color them. Normally you color your, um, your, 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 your points by something that you might know. In this case, I color my, 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 my samples by the, um, by the CBF AML type. So whether the patient had an inversion 16 or a TA21. And I do see that the first dimension, which is normally the ones that tells you, um, that brings up why patients are most different, it tells me that the first dimension separates these two type of um, uh, patients. And this is not news again, so I did the same exercise with other three published courts and I did see the same thing. So the first, when you put together CBFML patients, the differences in the expression induced by having either an inversion 16 or a TA21 uh, mutation, they are actually uh, pretty different. So this is the first difference that you see. So then what I did is that, well, we are interested in two relapse. As I said, we don't have many patients who relapse, and in particular, we have only three among the A21 group, and we have six among the inversion 16 group. So what I did to simplify and to kind of reduce the heterogeneity in the in the data, I only started looking by uh, I, I only started looking to this group. So I only took the inversion 16 group, and then I performed a differential expression uh, an analysis. And this is the result. So this is how we normally look at the results of a differential expression analysis, or one of the way in which we look like. <laughs> in this plot, every dot is actually one gene, not one patient. And the x-axis is the, an estimate of the difference between the groups. Groups means, well, if I compare the expression of patients who relapse and I compare the expression of patients who don't relapse, are they different? Well, if the answer, if they are around zero, it means they're not different. But if, the, if this estimate is higher than zero, we will see that these are probably, these are genes that are more expressed in patients who relapse. Whereas if the difference is below zero, we will say, oh, these genes are less expressed in patients who relapse. And the y-axis in this is an estimate of how confident we are that this is actually, a, this is a, we have enough evidence to say that the difference is actually significant. So I didn't find any significantly different genes, no, no, no significance at all. And was I surprised? Well, not sure, simply because we had really small sample size. Here I'm comparing um, six patients who relapse versus 11 patients who don't relapse. And what I did though, what I knew from the literature is that I read this paper that, in which they published this study done on CBF AML patients where they were comparing the expression of patients that have a mutation on KIT versus patients without the mutation. What I did is that the actual, so the uh, signature of patients who with the KIT mutation also uh, goes in the same direction as the patients that uh, re relapse. So if, if you compare patients who relapse versus patients who don't relapse. And this is because, well, I knew that five out of the six patients who relapse also have a mutations on KIT, which is telling me that, well, when I compare patients who relapse versus don't relapse, I'm all pretty much comparing uh, patients with KIT mutations and not KIT mutation. So from this analysis, well, I didn't find any significantly different genes in inversion 16. 
I, I observed that key mutations actually affect the expression of the genes. I've also performed other analyses, including the A21 patients, and I've combined the types, no DE genes at all. But that's okay, that, that happens. And, <laughs> and so what I, what I, the final things that I wanted to show you is that, well, do we see any changes over time? And I'm only gonna show you results based on mutations because I didn't see anything in the expression actually. <laughs> and to introduce, to introduce, I wanna introduce you to this concept before I show you the results, which is the, the estimate of the variant allele frequency. So imagine that you have a, you extract a, a, a sample from a patient with cancer, and you'll see that some cells, the cancer cells, that are, they are included in some, no, you have a sample with some cancer cell and some normal cells. And then you sequence, so we sequenced this information, and then we will see that from every cell, we, you know, this is an ideal case, we have a fragments without the mutations and fragment with the mutation. So when I say, when I color a cell red, I mean that cell has a particular mutation. So the variant allele frequency is simply the estimate of how many fragments with the mutation we see over the total of fragments that we observe. In this case, the estimate is 0.44. And as you can imagine, if we then study how the variant allele frequency changes over time, so after the treatment or when the patient's going to relapse, we will be able to see different types of mutations. So here I'm showing you our what I call respondent mutation. <clears throat> so be, before treatment, we have some uh, cells with the mutation, but then after treatment, everything goes away and they never come back. And if we look from the variant allele frequency point of view, we'll see that if we estimate at three time points for one patient, one mutation, it will go down and never come back. If we then add many more mutations, we look in different patients, we'll see this sort of trend for all the other mutations. Then we can look, for example, we'll see instead mutations that come back at relapse, so I call them re recurrent mutations. So we see the blue star at the beginning, then they go away, and then they come back. And we will observe something like this. So many mutations, this is, this is based on many mutations on several patients. And the last type of mutation that I want to introduce you is instead mutations that come back only at relapse, that, sorry, that grows that we observe only at relapse. There might be uh, mutations which are induced from the therapy. Again, if we look at the variant allele frequency, we'll see that we only see information at the third time point. So, what happens to KIT, for example? Do, we know that KIT seem to be associated with relapse, do we see it at later time points? So here I'm showing you the variant allele frequency in the first time point, so before they receive treatment. And here I'm showing you after treatment and at the end. So as you can see, all, all the mutations respond to treatment and they never come back and relapse. We have three mutations which don't go away, but they belong to patients who don't relapse. So I'm not really sure exactly. How's that, I mean, how that works. But all the mutations that were on the exonate of patient who relapse go away. So this is actually strange. Is it because we are missing something? Is it because there is a mutation but we don't observe it? What, what's happening? Well, is Keith Express, for example? Well, this is, I'm, I'm showing you now the expression of the whole Keith gene. And as you can see, the expression goes down after the treatment and then it comes back later on. So we'll see that KIT is actually expressed, but we don't observe the mutations any longer. But KIT seems to be associated with relapse. So this is actually a dilemma. So it's very, we, we didn't expect that. We are not sure how to interpret that. We thought that it was associated, but then we, we don't detect it. And then the question is, well, do we see any other genes, for example, that come up that might be interesting? And for example, if we look, we could look at patient by patient. So here I'm showing you at the variant allele frequency for five, uh, four mutations found in one patient. We have three mutations, the blue one, which come back after treatment, so this is diagnosis, remission, and relapse, and one mutation, the KIT mutation, which goes away. So in, even in patients where KIT go away, we do see other mutations coming back. So it's not that the cancer is not there or there's not enough cancer uh, in, into the sample, is that Kit, we, we don't see kit, and kit is expressed. 
So we could look at a patient by patient, but I thought, well, can we find a way to summarize this over the whole cohort? Because also we don't have that many patients. Looking at it one by one is kind of, you know, time consuming. And I've, I've decided to look, I've decided to sort of either this way of looking to the, at the whole mutations and how they change. Is, in the, in, the, in the whole cohort. So here I'm plotting, here I'm, 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 I'm computing the difference between the viral frequency at remission and the viral frequency before they, they receive the treatment. And on the y-axis, I'm plotting instead the viral frequency at the relapse, so at the later time points, and the viral frequency at the remission. So to see how you could read this type of plot, well, I've shown you before this sort of what, what I call respondent mute mutations, if I plot all those mutations into this sort of, into this diagram, I will, all, I will see all the dots there. Same thing if I plot the re, re, recurrent mutations, I will see them all there. And if I plot instead the relapse specific mutations, I will see them on the Y axis over here. And as you can imagine, these two types of mutations are the more interesting. So because they are the mutations that come back after treatment or they drag the cancer to come back, or they simply, they are resistant mutations that come back at the, after treatment. So I went and looked into our cord. Here I'm plotting, <coughs> I'm plotting all the mutations across all the patients in the CBFML cord after I cleaned them, after I tied everything up. And as you can see, we have a lot of respondent mutations, we have some recurrent mutations, and we have some relapse-specific mutations. So what are those mutations? When I color them by function, so by function I mean function that I found on other AML papers, so functions of commonly mutated AML genes. You can see that we have a lot of pink genes, pink mutations here, which are all on genes from the tyrosine kinase signaling pathways, other, all the KIT and RAS, JAK2 mutations, which don't come back later on. What about the other ones then? So here I'm labeling, I'm labeling the names of the genes. And again, when I look at the name of the genes, every gene is different. It's like every patient has a different mutation. Like it's kind of hard to see what's going on. What we can do, for example, and it would be better if we, of course, we had more of these samples, is we can look at the pathways, actually. Is there a common pathways that, for example, come back and relapse? Because I'm seeing that kit doesn't come back, but is there something else? And here I'm seeing that even though the genes are different, I do see common pathways like DNA repair, DNA meth methylation pathways coming back. Is that important? I mean, it's kind of hard to say at the moment, but maybe by having more samples and trying to figure out, for example, in this plot, if you could see interesting pattern, probably it will be quite useful. So I've shown you how I analyze the changes over time for the mutations in the cord, and I've shown you that KIT mysteriously goes away and relapse. However, we do see other genes mutated coming back at later time point, especially in these two pathways, and of course, we need to do way, a lot more work in terms of to understanding what is the clinical significance of these mutations. And I haven't found strong patterns in the e e expression of the genes over time. And I haven't shown, of course, these uh, results. So this, this brings me to what, what, what are we gonna do next? Well, the first thing that I wanna do, we wanna do, of course, we wanna validate the presence of these key mutations. So do we see it in the DNA? Is it really not there or we just don't see it from the RNA? And also we would like to evaluate the clinical importance of the pathways that I see mutated at later time points. And of course we are in the, in the process with Edward Chu of collecting more CBFML patients from the RMH in order to validate if what we see in our court might be similar to what is observed somewhere else. Because it's not common to have courts of patients which are followed up at diagnosis, remission and relapse. They are pretty rare to find actually. So this brings me to also summarizing what I've shown you in terms of the methods that I've used. So by reading through, I haven't developed any new workflows to, uh, to you know, to, uh, det to actually detect the mutations from the RNA, but what I did was to try to provide, uh, with a, an R package, to try to provide a way to standardize and combine the variants. And I know there should be one user in the room, that, um, so I hope that this could be useful for, to other people as well. I've also 
developed an R Shiny app which allows to explore interactively the mutations that are combined uh, all together. And I haven't shown this method, however, the gene e expression that I've used were actually really uh, heterogeneous, which means that the samples were collected from blood, from bone marrow, they contain different amount of blood and normal cells, and I have done extensive use of this method, which is called RUV, which was developed by Terry Speed and Johan uh, from the University of Michigan. And the idea of RUV is to remove the unwanted va variations in the, in, in the data in order to isolate the biological um, effect of interest that, you might, that, that you're trying to, uh, to find and, and to estimate. And I've shown you another way in which we can look at the variant sh and the, the variant frequency shift over time to spot interesting mutations over time. I want to conclude by thanking a lot of the people and patients from the clinical trial that I've been working with, especially Andrew Roberts and the LLLG group and the WEHI for the sequencing and uh, in particular the um, University of Melbourne for the scholarship and WEHI as well for the Edith Moffat uh, scholarship that allowed me to go to visit some labs in the US. And I haven't mentioned anything about another clinical trial that I've been working with, similar to the LLLG, but different patients, different types of AML, but different concepts, so samples over time, patients over time, and this was, this was all done as part of the, uh, so uh, these were all patients um, f followed up by the Alfred Hospital. So thanks to all people involved in this, um, in this, in, in, in this project. And I, um, I made a short video <laughs> to thank everyone. It's very cringy, but I mean, <laughs> I, I just made it last night to thanks, because there's so many other people that I want to thank and I didn't want to drag it for too long. So, well, I want to, there's no music, don't worry. I want to <laughs> thank, of course, Terry, because he was an amazing supervisor for believing in me from, you know, the first time when I arrived in the Institute roughly six years ago and for supporting me through all the PhD and answering to all questions for being so available. Thanks to Ian for uh, you know being patient with me in uh, when I was trying to learn about cancer, how we study leukemia, how we try to look at the mutations when I didn't know anything in the beginning. Christopher, I don't know if he's here, but <laughs> probably I wouldn't have done half of my PhD if it wasn't for him. Really, he helped me so much, and in particular with answering my question related to cancer and mutations. And the same goes for Edward, too, who is, um, who, <laughs> well, I can't even say. <laughs> who was um, really, I'm really grateful for your time. I know you're busy in trying to help me interpret in the clinical results that I got from my, from my data. And thanks to the other member of the committee, Melanie and Tony, for a helpful suggestion that I got along the way. And well, a big thanks to the Speed Lab, in particular to Marie, for always being such a compassionate friend and always be there to help you. And really, um, thanks to everyone else in the Speed Lab, because, and also from the old bi bioinformatics division, because I don't know, I found that bioinformatics changed a lot in the past six years since I joined. And I find that it's not just a place where you go there and work, but it's actually, you have friends who really care hear about you, not just about, you know, the research that you do, but really about how you are and, you know, how the, your feelings and how you're doing. I want to say a special mention, though, to Gordon and um, Alex for all the RNIC questions that I ask along the way. <laughs> this was the night before the shaving. <laughs> and uh, probably also, um, uh, well, a big thank you for all the lunches and the, and the, chatted, the chats together. And to Sepi De Fosheri, we made this special moment as well. <clears throat> and uh, well, these are some of the nights in bioinformatics, <laughs> roughly 9, 9.30 p.m. Well, as Terry mentioned, Our Ladies was an integral part of my PhD. It started, we started it in 2016 in seminar room two. And really, I think that probably this community has changed me so much. And uh, there are people that I met through the Our Ladies that come from overseas that are today here. Thanks to my partner, Stina, for being such a caring and loving boyfriend and for uh, being so patient 
patients coming to pick me up late at night and making me lots of delicious meals and just tells me, you're going to be great, you're going to be okay, you're going to be fine. <laughs> and of course, like, thanks to Robbie. I mean, it's kind of hard to explain. It's such a special relationship uh, from a work perspective, personal perspective. <laughs> I'm, really, I'm really looking forward to all the other adventures that will happen and that will go, that will go from, from, from now on. And I, well, a special thanks to all the people that I've lived with and they keep, you know, past, present flatmates because, you know, living far away from home is really hard, but when you go home in the evening, even if it was a very bad day and there's always someone there that wants to talk to you, that, you know, it's happy to have a chat with you, it's really special. And of course, to all the PhD comrades, because... I mean, uh, if we high, I mean, if PhD can be really lonely at times, and you really need the support and to share your pain with everyone else, probably as well. <laughs> there, are, there were also some good times. <laughs> And I, well, I wouldn't have done anything without the information technology services with all my downsampling and simulations. They helped me all the way, all the time. Thanks to the event crew team for a lot of ther therapeutical moment, moving chairs. And to the tea room crew, not just for the biscuits, but really just for the laughs and for asking every morning, how are you, Anna? How is it going? Just starting the day in a, in a good way, actually. Thanks to everyone else outside of Weha, especially the football team, all this <laughs> dreaming for success, I'll try to get there. Thanks to all my family, which is now looking me through the bed, uh, fr fr from bed, to my, all my family and especially my grandparents, who I'm really looking forward to see very soon, and all my uh, friends that um, supported me from very distant, <laughs> from the distance. This is the end. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you so much, Anna. That was super cool. Thank uh, you. Uh, one question. So, um, hey, can we? Um, is there a way of establishing um, how bad people relapse? And in case we can establish how bad, like if there is a scale of relapseness, uh, could we use this information maybe like to increase the power of the discovery, maybe like of which mutants are important? Maybe like maybe some people relapse just a little bit and other people relapse like a lot or something like that. Um, I mean, I don't know. I mean, the, the, uh, t what, what I know is that the way in which they define is if a patient is relapsing is by measuring, is by um, monitoring the percentage of blast content into the cell. And that's the measure that I show you, so how many blast cells we think there are in the blood, so the estimate. So I don't know if they have specific measures for badness. That would mean maybe having specific mutations, which we know they are really, really bad, but I don't think maybe we know that. Or is there, I don't know if Edward... That he can answer better than me? No, there's, there's not a way. It's just a matter of seeing when the blast cells comes back, come back. Yeah. Great talk again. Thank um, you. You uh, know or imagine that other type of uh, genomic aberration could be as informative or more informative than... Uh, Sorry, what did you say, new? Other type of genomic aberrations, um, maybe yeah. bigger scale could uh, improve... Um, you know, this kind of study, although maybe cannot be detected with RNA, but as a general comment. Like you mean structural, other structural <laughs> variants? Yeah, for or, example, yeah. yeah. Or copy numbers. Or... Yeah, copy numbers. Yeah, well, in terms of um, copy number, we do also detect copy number. I haven't talked about it, but we do look into that. And there are some copy numbers that are common in CBFAML patients, like um, uh, copy number on uh, chromosome 8 and chromosome 9. However, I don't think there is anything that was associated. I've only found them, m m most of them, in patients who don't relapse. So I don't think that there's, um, they have found something that correlates, that is associated with relapse based on that. Did you have a question? <laughs> Hello? <laughs> I hope that's not me. All right, um, just in terms of your relapse on kit, I was, it was a little unclear. 
is it there's no kit expression at all or no mutant kit expression at all? So it's a bit unclear. Is, is, do we just not see the kit mutants? Yep. Because, for example, there's a reversion in mutation or there's yeah. some other mutation that makes that version of kit completely dysfunctional as a way to evade therapy, or are we just losing kit completely? Yeah, so I've shown a slide. Maybe I went through quickly to that. So we, we did, so kit is actually comes back to be expressed. So I do see kit mutations coming back. And when I look, for example, at a whole pathway, so for example, I look at all genes that collaborate with kit to see if the expression come back, again, it comes back. So I, yeah, we do, just don't see kit. And I've, we checked in IGVs, you know, sample by sample, there's nothing that, that I see. But the expression, even though it's lower at relapse because the cancer is not as high as the diagnosis. We don't, yeah, we don't see it. I don't and that see includes wild-type kit that you don't see? There anymore. is wild-type, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, there, there, so is, there is the expression is of the wild-type, yeah. Okay. It is lower, the expression, but there is. Okay. Uh, I was just wondering, um, a lot of the mutations you were talking about were sort of driver or activator mutations um, or oncogenes. Did you see any, or could your data show loss of sort of tumor suppressor genes, like things that would stay uh, expressed in other, <laughs> um, stay expressed in the non-relapse that were missing in the relapse patients? Uh, yeah, so we, the, so the benefits is actually looking at the RNA compared, for example, to study where they only look at screening of panels of AML genes, is that we can look at mutations in every gene. So I look at every single gene and I, the reason why I have alerted just those genes is because they're the ones that I know and some of them, I actually spot them and I went and look, look for the functions. So there's a lot of actually of other genes which I haven't, which I really haven't looked into what they do and what they are. Like there's a lot of gray dots around here, which I haven't annotated. I don't know what they are. I mean, I probably should go one by one and define what they are, but you could like, these methods is just looking at everything that is there. It's not just spot. I'm just highlighting those ones because I know what they are. Yeah. So if, if then you, oh, can you look into that, that gene so, so that I could look into that? Hi, Anna. Very nice talk. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I was wondering, I noticed at the start when you put up the mutations in patients, some of them looked like they had a single nucleotide variant and then also an indel. Yeah. Is that, do you think they have uh, homozygous mutations or do you think that's very heterogeneity in the tumor sample? And then does that affect how you do the... Which one variant? do you mean when I show the, the top mutated genes? Yeah, at the very start. Um, yeah, so they have... Well, I'm not going to go back too heavy. Oh, yeah. um, they... Uh, what's your question? Sorry, so I do see indoles. For example, when keep as indoles and... The, um, each patient and their mutation. I think it was this one. This one, yeah. yeah. It looks like some of them seem to have both an indel. Yeah, some have both. So for example, in the ones, especially this is true for KIT, so some of the patients had both the hotspot mutation, the SNP on exon 17, and they also had the mutations on exon 8. So all the exon 8 are all the indels. So all the mutations on the exon 8 of KIT were complex indels. Whereas all the blue ones are the exon 17 point mutations. So you think that might be on the same allele? That they have two mutations? Uh, I should look at the vardenal frequency, I guess, to see maybe, I, yeah, if it is similar. But yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't think I thought about that. Oh, Anna, great talk. Um, Thank you. So you were saying that you don't see much uh, changes in gene expression over time in the tumor cells, but did you have a quick look at the non-tumor cells if you see something happening there? Because normally you filter it out, but yeah. that would be interesting if they maybe support these tumor cells are coming back and you see changes in those cells. Yeah. So when I say I don't see differences, it's like when I put all patients together, I don't see consistent differences. What I think it's happening, the patient have specific mutations which affect in different ways, and this is one thing. Maybe if I look at every single patient, I will see some differences. To answer to the other part is that it's not, well, this is bulk RNA, mm -hmm. so it's not that trivial to know what is t just tumor cells and what is normal expression. I've been trying to work on that, especially using the RUV methods that I was mentioning at the end to sort of adjust for the tumor cells and normal cells. But I haven't looked into that because, yeah, that's not that easy with the bulk yeah. of cells. 
Yeah. Anna, you have done down sampling to select the coverage for mutation. Yeah. Have you done this analysis for D analysis? Does your D eat No. Okay. There was, I was going to do it, and a lot of other people have. There's way more studies done on this on expression, and I haven't done it myself. We had a student that was maybe doing it, but we then we got, we, we didn't get into that. Anna, um, going back to the swift plot, which you don't have to necessarily do, but the. Um, there were a number of orange spots which were chromatin remodelers or, or uh, cohesin. Do you know what specifically those genes are? One was particularly high on the X, huh? There are famous. Um, I can't remember their names, though. Uh, but if you name one, probably it was. Right. Okay. <laughs> that sounds good. That's, that's a... That's not easy, yeah? Um, do, and just one step further, does that... To, in my mind, that speaks to the fact that a lot of changes are probably outside of, well, we know they're outside of expressed regions, but then, of course, affect that. And you're blind to that, yeah? We, we that wouldn't change. detect things that aren't in expressed regions, because this is from RNA, so we won't see things that are not outside of the expressed regions. Uh, yeah, so that. I think it's, it's the last question. <coughs> Um, I was just wondering if there was any correlation between the uh, just the number of mutations in the recurring uh, patients, because there was a lot of a lot of the changes were in DNA repair and things like that. Were there any differences, not in specific genes, but just in the, the number? number yeah, well, there are a lot. Of, I haven't specific. Yeah, I think there are a lot of mutations, but I haven't. I don't know to what compare it to. I guess I haven't. Maybe we could actually see if that's the case, especially in patients with the DNA repair genes. If patients that have that, they actually have a higher number of mutations. But I haven't, yeah, I haven't looked into that. Perhaps we should wrap up. Uh, we're going to thank Anna and then also join us outside for Prosecco. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs>